National Parks Subcommittee will come to order here at Mesa Verde National Park. And before we begin this morning, I'd like to recognize Terry Knight, who's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, for a welcoming prayer. Before I do the invocation, I just want to thank all of you for being here and say good morning. And uh, traditionally, when we, uh, the Native people, have a gathering, or what, whatever purposes, we always call upon the, the Creator and, and the Great Spirit to give us that added assistance. And so, whatever we're doing and whatever we're going to be discussing, in that way, we have that some kind of a satisfactory feeling that uh, we have accomplished something and that kind of paves the way for our endeavors, whatever we're doing. So I just want to say that and I'll go ahead and uh, offer my, uh, my prayer. I want to talk when I forget no more of my raise about our raise and to what now most get raise and to what now most when the world ways about, I would tell you, you want to equal to tell who back from a room of Palatine, who tell to walk there, more than a brutal. If we are known, we get naked nay and the wild one, the tower over there, and Senator Mark Udo, and then my camera. We all raise more rattle, perhaps we all raise. No more raise and put a milk on the cake or a room of ya. Then you came over to why you watch there. National Park but soon, what's the my boy? I must go and can I watch me on that race? One of the cake crawl, what part of the cake crawl, my cap, and my pie cap, and what to buy your one and mine over the one. Push up, ask them over the road, one of the cake crawl, turn to power roads, up or run every to it. Most of them up on a perky cow. Say, one of us, the pop of pop of work, Maroma, and say, and only get to say, and Maman of work out, Maman of Tamok out, Man Gunamurian, first one of Niko, Tamo Prochen of Tertipa, Moya Monum, Pouchin, Maro Makan, they have two Tamok, the Ma Ratum, Moya side up, Gan Monoke, Mokti work, Moyan, Puad Rapa, Upa Murapoya, for a Unica Moga Pope of Mike, for Ganoma Havas, or a work out is from Tertipa. We got a sack of monopoly on my guy again, get to Pacon and Port Portway. Ah, say, and the Tawai, the Moy Tawat Mova Tantawe, a Yoksra, we can also, amen. Thank you, Terry. I'm tempted to ask Terry how much snow he has to create or deliver the rest of his life. <laughs> we all know uh, any time there's moisture, we're great. Thank you for setting the right tone. And I had a chance just to go for a couple of minutes uh, to the museum and uh, look down at Spruce Tree House. And it only takes a moment to realize the power that's here on this unique wonderful green mesa, Mesa Verde. So welcome to all of you. I'm really pleased to be able to chair a hearing of the Senate Subcommittee on National Parks to examine the issues affecting the National Park Service's management of archaeological, cultural, and historic resources, both here at Mesa Verde and in other national parks throughout the country. I'd also like today during this hearing to explore how the resources can contribute economic development and job growth in the communities surrounding these special places we call parks. When people think about national parks, they think of the amazing landscapes and spectacular scenery, but many don't realize that nearly two-thirds of the almost 400 sites protected as a part of the national park system were primarily established to preserve cultural and historic resources. In fact, Mesa Verde was, des was designated as a national park 
1906, and I think actually it was a national monument, and then later it was, uh, I don't know if I, uh, see, was it a national park in 1906? All right, thank you for that clarification. So this is right. Uh, we all know the important process by which uh, often national monuments are designated and end up uh, being designated by the Congress uh, as a national park, the Grand Canyon being one notable example. But the Congress had wisdom in 1906. Could we see some of that wisdom in 2000? <laughs> But in fact, uh, Mesa Verde was designated as a national park in 1906 to protect its amazing archaeological resources and the famous cliff dwellings, making it the very first national park created primarily to protect cultural resources. I see a number of friends here, among them Jimbo Bukaru, who uh, uh, worked with Outward Bound, as did I, for many years. And uh, for, for us, and I think everybody gathered here today, the personal connection uh, is a powerful one. I, had the good fortune to pick my parents. Uh, my mother, uh, Patricia Emery, uh, was a Coloradan. And she loved this part of the world. And as a young boy, uh, we traveled over and over again to this part of the Southwest. And I became intimately familiar with uh, Keats Seal and Patatakan uh, in Navajo National Monument. I spent many a day on the floor of Canyon uh, de Shea. I was amazed at the archaeoastronomy sites at Chaco Canyon, uh, the list uh, goes on and on. I even imagined what it would be like to be a John Wetherill uh, and uh, a Richard Wetherill to ride to the rim of one of these canyons some hundred years ago. So this is really special and personal to me. Um, and in that context, Mesa Verde really makes history come alive. But it's also a, a really important economic resource. It provides uh, important local jobs, and over half a million visitors come here from around the world every year. Now, it's a difficult economic time, and you hear some people saying, well, can we afford to protect our special places and our history and our culture? Uh, and my answer is a resounding yes. I might even say it's a hell yes. Uh, and that's part of what I want to do is highlight the strong benefits to the local economy that a park like Mesa Verde brings. In fact, that's why I wanted to hold this hearing here today to help draw attention to the amazing resources here, the threats they face, and the steps that need to be taken to protect them, and to recognize all the values that the park provides. As an example, I know the park is building a new visitor and research center. We glimpsed it on the way up the, the beautiful winding road to the top of the mesa, and in addition to the new uh, research Center, their road improvements that are going to occur right there at the park investment, park entrance, I should say. And those investments uh, not only help showcase what the park has to offer, make it more accessible to visitors, and help protect uh, threatened, irreplaceable resources, but they're also important to local economies. Just in Montezuma County, Mesa Verde National Park has helped generate around $70 million each year in tourism related revenue which helps support about a thousand local jobs. When one job matters, a thousand local jobs are very, very significant. I think it's uh, important to note that besides the construction and tourism related benefits, the park also provides for important historical and archeological research throughout the region and the country. Uh, this region is blessed with cultural resources. I should note that uh, Senator Bennett and I have authored a bill to create the Chimney Rock Archaeological Area National Monument. Uh, we've been joined by Congressman Tipton in introducing the bill in the House. Uh, that site is very close to where we are here today, and it would become a unit of the National Park Service. Uh, it would, uh, when we get it done, I might say, if when we get Chimney Rock designated, it would help protect the uh, unique Chaco and archaeological site that's located between Durango and Rosa Springs. There are two spectacular rock spires there, as well as the remains of the Great House and other buildings built by the ancestors of the Pueblo Indians over a thousand years ago. Much remains unknown about the Chaco people and the site itself, but clearly it was a site of uh, astronomical and religious significance, and it's certainly a very important archaeological site. But with that backdrop, uh, it's important to note that parks with cultural resources face a number of challenges. And that's also what I want to explore at this hearing. 
For example, Mesa Verde's cliff dwellings are threatened by weather changes such as drought, which then in turn causes an increase in wildfires. And in fact, uh, the super and I were talking, uh, and I understand that over half the park uh, has been burned at some point in the last 15 years. Now on the interesting side, the fires have exposed a lot of new archeological sites, but now those sites are vulnerable to erosion and rain damage. And they're also at risk of being damaged by non-native plants and animals in the park, as well as looting and vandalism. But if you look beyond Mesa Verde, the management of cultural resources throughout our country poses a tremendous challenge for the National Park Service. The Park Service preserves and protects over 2 million archaeological sites, over 27,000 historic structures, and over 120 million museum objects and historic documents. So those numbers uh, are uh, amazing uh, to me, and they point out that the Park Service has vast responsibilities, which are even more of a challenge as the agency faces increasing budget limitations. So one of my goals as the uh, chairman of this subcommittee was to spend more time on the oversight of park management issues. So in that spirit, I've asked a very distinguished panel of witnesses to come here today so that we can better learn what can be done to protect these amazing resources, what still remains to be done, and any legislative actions that we need to consider in the Congress. And I'd like to explore additional economic opportunities related to our cultural heritage and what we can do to encourage generations of Americans to come and enjoy our national parks. Finally, I'd like to thank, uh, I should have used a more formal title, Cliff, I'm sorry, Park Superintendent Cliff Spencer uh, and his fantastic staff uh, for their help in making this hearing possible. Uh, I'd like to particularly recognize Bill Nelligan uh, for his efforts. He went the extra mile, Superintendent, to ensure that this uh, day was planned uh, so that we could maximize our time. Uh, as a quick aside, there was a proposal uh, a while back to privatize the National Park Service. I sit on the Armed Services Committee in the Senate. Uh, Jim Dyer is here, a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And when I heard that proposal, uh, to me, uh, it sounded uh, a little bit like we're going to privatize the Marine Corps. We're not going to privatize the Marine Corps, we're not going to privatize the National Park Service. They're wonderful, unique American institutions <coughs> full of dedicated people uh, who are part of what uh, I call the portfolio of America's best ideas. So uh, thank you, Superintendent, for all you do and your staff uh, do as well. So let's turn to our, because I didn't come here to listen to myself talk for very long, I hope. Uh, Let's turn to our first witness, uh, Laura Joss of the National Park Service. Ms. Joss serves as the Intermountain Region Association Director for Cultural Resources. Uh, welcome, glad to have you here, Laura. We look forward to your testimony, and uh, when you're finished, I'll have a few questions I'll direct your way. So thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Senator Udall. And I do want to correct that my title is um, Deputy Regional Director and Chief of Staff. Thank you for that, that correction. <laughs> that we will make sure that's in the record. Okay. Um, well, welcome, Senator Udall, and all of our distinguished guests who made it up the hill this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, we, are, we are honored to have you at Mesa Verde National Park and the Intermountain Region of the National Park Service. We've, we are honored you've chosen this World Heritage Site for your hearing. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today at this oversight hearing on issues affecting management of archaeological, cultural, and historic resources at Mesa Verde National Park and other units of the National Park System. I would like to submit our full statement for the record and summarize the statement here. Without objection. Thank you. Congress established over half of the national parks specifically to protect cultural resources and almost all parks contain some type of cultural heritage. Resources are at risk for, from dis, of destruction from lack of maintenance, intentional looting, and vandalism. More intense fire regimes and changes in precipitation and temperature patterns have begun to affect the stability and integrity of cultural resources as well. Nationally, the National Park Service is working to coordinate and redirect cultural resource efforts in a way that aligns with Director Jarvis's emphasis on stewardship, 
relevancy, education, and the workforce. And that supports both the President's America's Great Outdoors Initiative and the National Park Service Call to Action. Current efforts are focused on using available resources to address our most critical needs, providing renewed coherence to our efforts, and identifying areas where additional support is needed. The National Park Service has already started to address these goals by planning to integrate and link our 14 cultural resource databases to facilitate management efficiencies. One of the most successful responses to the challenges of caring for cultural resources in recent years has been the Vanishing Treasures Program, which is an Intermountain Region initiative to support cultural resource management in parks in the arid west. This program is helping to address the devastating destruction of irreplaceable historic and prehistoric structures, as well as the potential loss of traditional building and preservation expertise. Mesa Verde National Park is a good example of a park that, with support from the Vanishing Treasures program, identified and prioritized cultural resources and took concrete steps to preserve and protect the most significant resources. Since 1998, the program has provided funding for cultural resource projects and to support positions for cultural resource staff. As a result, 106 cliff dwelling sites in backcountry areas, including 24 dwellings that have been affected by wildfires, have been assessed and prioritized for future documentation and preservation treatments. Vanishing Treasures also funded documentation at two large cliff dwelling sites, Spring House and Spruce Tree House. The National Park Service is implementing a variety of other cultural resource management <coughs> strategies throughout the national park system. In Nevada, the Southern Nevada Agency Partnership shares resources among federal agencies for a volunteer site stewardship program. Private <coughs> citizens assist agencies in monitoring and protecting archaeological sites on federal lands from looting and vandalism and receive training in site stewardship. This community civic education is crucial for the protection of the sites. The Cultural Site Stewardship Program received the Department of the Interior Cooperative Conservation Service Award in 2007. In Hawaii, traditional organizations and local communities are working with the National Park to repair temple compounds that were damaged by earthquake. The stone structures are being repaired with traditional methods and traditional tools the park has facilitated sharing and teaching these technologies, and the community involvement benefited the park by saving $3.5 million in repairs. For their work, the Coordinating Traditional Organization was awarded a Partners in Conservation Award in 2011 from Secretary Salazar. We have many different programs that train young people to be tomorrow's cultural resources stewards. In Texas, San Antonio Missions National Historical Park has partnered with its friends group, Los Compadres, and a youth group to develop an apprenticeship program in masonry repair. <coughs> in Massachusetts, the Salem Maritime National Historic Site has developed the First Jobs Youth Program to provide employment to young people while teaching them cultural resource preservation skills. Also in Massachusetts, NPS employees at the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site are working to get cultural landscape learning activities into the third grade curriculum of the public schools. To date, a thousand third graders from the Boston and Brookline public schools have participated in the Good Neighbors program, and the program has greatly raised the visibility of the NPS in this region as a source of teaching and learning. Here in Colorado, we have hosted hundreds of young people through the Colorado Preserve America Youth Summit program. They have held on-site programs here at Mesa Verde, Great Sand Dunes, Florissant Fossil Beds, Dinosaur National Monument, and in 2012, they plan to be at Rocky Mountain National Park. Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss our efforts to meet our cultural resource challenges. This concludes my prepared statement. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Deputy Regional Director, for that <laughs> I, before I direct the, some questions here, I want to, I want to recognize uh, State Representative J. Paul Brown, uh, who's in the audience. Thank you for being here, Representative. Um, if, if I had a chance to visit with you before uh, you ran, I might have tried to talk you out of running for the elected office. There were worse things than losing an election, one was winning an election.
<laughs> Jim Dyer, Jim Dyer knows that. Thank you most seriously for, for being here. Um, a few minutes. Is that is that me getting too close to the mic? Yes. 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 That is? yes. Is that right, Wanda? Yes. <laughs> Sounds like somebody shifting a massive chair on the floor. Uh, a few minutes ago, I highlighted the uh, economic benefits, or at least some that accrue to the uh, Four Corners region because of Mesa Verde. Do you have any sense of whether other cultural and historical parks uh, throughout the national park system provide similar economic benefits to their local economies? Definitely. Um, when I was doing cultural resources at Yellowstone, I was, um, <laughs> I was um, key to, maybe it's me, maybe shut it um, creating a, uh, a museum partnership with all of our surrounding communities. As you know, at Yellowstone, there are four, there are four entrances, and our gateway communities are very important um, to our visitors as well as to the park. So what we tried to do through the creation of the Yellowstone Museum Consortium was um, share our visitors with those sites by informing the visitors of those sites and also providing professional assistance to the museums outside of the park. But this is a very important issue to the Park Service as a whole and um, it's listed in the call to action, Director Jarvis's current call to action, and actually our regional director, John Russells, leads up the Economic um, Benefits Committee of the call to action. So we're all very interested in it and document those numbers as well as improve them. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me without the mic? Yeah. I've turned this off. I don't know whether that, maybe that mic over there is live and creating that. That's a unique kind of feedback. It seems. <laughs> um, let me move to another subject which you touched on in your remarks. I, I've been trying for years to find ways to get children mm -hmm. into our parks, both because of the exposure to their natural and cultural treasures, but also employment programs that provide for the youth jobs working on our public lands. And then finally, because uh, we uh, are seeing increasingly lowered levels of fitness uh, and increasing levels of obesity in our population. And a unfit country is not a strong country, uh, or a fit country by definition will be, will be a strong country. Can you talk about the things you're doing in Colorado through the Park Service to improve access and encourage access on the part of not just children but us adults uh, to our parks and any park-related uh, youth job initiatives? Definitely. Um, I did mention the Colorado Preserve America Youth Summit, yes. which I um, we are very proud to help assist with that program. And in um, Rocky Mountain National Park, we have seven different programs that that provide a variety of work, educational, and research opportunities for young people, particularly urban youth initiatives. Um, and these, these programs address youth with a range of needs, ages, backgrounds, and provide training and employment, and then encourage young people to obtain the skills to compete for permanent National Park Service jobs. And I can read those names if you'd like. Why don't you submit them for the record? That's okay. That's um, we have Pathways to Parks, Eagle Rock Internship Program, Groundwork Denver Internship Program, the Environmental Learning for Kids Internship Program, 5050 Program, the Pro Ranger Program, and the George Melendez Wright Climate Change Internship and Fellowship Program. Yeah, but, um, David, do you want me to do? Well, I just want to tell you because we need to make this. We're, we're doing a transcript for the Senate. So if you turn that mic on, we turn the speakers off. But that way, the, the tape recorder is picking up the, the. So we can get the. All has to be in reverse. You want to speak into the mic? Well, you just have it on. You can have it on the table. If you just keep the mic on, on. And that would be better. Sorry about that. Thanks, dude. you have anything else to add to that, uh, that list, that question? No, no. no. Thank you. For a number of years, uh, the Park Service has had a successful program known as the Natural Resource Challenge, which, as I understand it, helped increase funding for uh, protection of threatened natural resources at our parks throughout the country. Given the success of that program, should the Park Service consider establishing a similar challenge to identify and protect cultural resources, maybe the natural 
cultural resource challenge would be a term we could apply. Um, the Park Service is facing great challenges in managing cultural resources, as, we, as we, we've discussed earlier. To identify those, what resources we have, what the threats to those resources are, how best to respond to those threats, and to share the knowledge learned so that all involved are empowered to make better decisions, we're developing strategic priorities for focusing our efforts, using our available resources to address the most critical needs and providing renewed, renewed coherence to our efforts. This coordinated effort to better deploy our resources in the management of our cultural heritage articulates with Director Jarvis's call to action and with Obama, President Obama's America's Great Outdoors mm -hmm. Initiative. What, and we also hope to use um, successes that we've learned at individual parks to extend those out service-wide. How do we pay for this in a tough budget environment? Uh, well, we have appreciated your, um, the Secretary advocating for the Historic Preservation Fund, and the Appropriations mm -hmm. Committee has maintained a steady level of funding. Um, we also appreciate the support that's been given to our Cultural Resources Program. Mm -hmm. But we need to be vigilant is what I hear you saying, and I think I want to underline opinion on my part, but I think it's backed up by the facts that the, there are many reasons to do this including uh, economic reasons. Um, here's an easy question. What do you think the most critical priority the Park Service needs to address is with respect to cultural resource management? I actually have um, a list of those, if I can find it. That's great. Um, some of the most we're, we're biased, we're Western, <laughs> we're, or, as my friends from California just remind me, we're Rocky Mountain Westerners, I'll, I'll wear that title, <laughs> they, they, they can be far Westerners, we're Rocky Mountain Westerners. Okay. Um, some of the most pressing challenges in cultural resource management include, include loss of structural integrity of the exterior adobe walls at the Spanish Mission at Chumacacri National Historic mm -hmm. Park. In both 2010 and 2011, southern Arizona received major rains over a period of several days. The rains softened the adobe walls, and um, a hole 14 feet wide and 10 feet tall was created in the sanctuary where one, when 1.5 tons of material collapsed. Another um, is that cultural, I'm sorry, climate change is threatening the integrity of archaeological resources at high altitudes, and you referred to this earlier, Senator but formerly protected sites are now within the fire danger zone, and melting glaciers and snow are reveal, revealing frozen objects and artifacts that deteriorate quickly. And then the third, um, it would be that 76% of the parks in the Intermountain inter region manage significant museum collections, such as those at Grand Teton National Park and Little Bighorn National Monument, without the benefit of a professional level museum curator. Thank you for those three years. In, in the parks, or uh, and I think specifically Mesa Verde, in the uh, debate we've had as uh, Western communities uh, when it comes to pot hunting, for lack of a better term, it's a crude, it's a crude term, but those who vandalize uh, sites that then in effect rob uh, the future generations of knowledge and then also, of course, break faith with our. Native American brothers and sisters, because those are sacred sites. Uh, have those kinds of activities and incidents uh, been uh, rare uh, in the parks? Um, I I can't give you figures on mm -hmm. that. That has we have addressed <coughs> those incidents through the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they do happen, but we're trying to work to address them as quickly as possible and to prevent them. And I know we have similar challenges on our forest and BLM and national wildlife uh, units. Um, this is an iconic site here. Um, what are some of the best practices learned here that have been 
uh, applied to other parks or could be replicated in other national, uh, national parks, national park units. Um, Mesa Verde National Park and its friends group, the Mesa Verde Foundation, is a good example of the ways that partners can work together effectively to protect cultural resources. <coughs> and the park has also successfully leveraged National <coughs> Treasures funding to complete many long-term rehabilitation projects. Um, can I go back to the previous question? Will you uh, provide for the record statistics on, on looting and vandalism in the national parks? Sure, uh, we will provide you with those. I'm sure you can. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Um, let's turn to uh, the Native American communities that often uh, abut uh, our national parks. Uh, in some cases, are intimately interwoven with the national parks. I think, for example, Canyon de Chez, which has a, a unique management regime. Um, what steps does the Park Service take to coordinate? management and protection of cultural resources with interested tribes? Um, we, we work together with the tribes through tribal consultation on a regular basis um, <clears throat> and related to the sacred sites on parklands, if I could address that, they, um, mm -hmm. the Park Service is committed to Section 304 of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 that ensures confidentiality about um, the information about historic resources that would cause a significant invasion of the right to privacy that would risk harm to the resources or interfere with the use of sacred sites. And Mesa Verde National Park is a good model for holding information about archaeological sacred sites confidential. And, and would that be um, one of the other best practices perhaps or it has been, could be applied to other uh, park Absolutely. units for their cultural resources. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to offer for the record I at this know. point? Do you have any questions you want to ask me? No, that's not done. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, well, thank you, for, uh, Deputy Director, for your testimony and um, for your interest. Uh, we'd like to invite you to stay uh, on the stage. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to call the uh, next panel to the stage if we want. Thank you very much. Thank you. We need to bring that phone. I'll pull another chair over. Everybody's on the back. Senator Whitehead is here. That's his family. But great to see you here. 
And uh, again, thank you all for taking the time. And I know Terry, it's still snowing out there, it's starting to <laughs> starting to accumulate. Um, we we love our moisture, though. Let me introduce uh, the members of our uh, second panel uh, as a group, and then we'll then we'll come back and start. Uh, with Chairman Hayes with the, the initial comments, but we do have Chairman Hayes, Gary Hayes of the Youth Mountain Youth Tribe, and I'm uh, really happy, happy to welcome you here. I did want to mention that uh, the tribe, and I think all of us lost uh, recently, a, a much loved and respected leader, former Chairman Ernest House Sr. He, he was a friend uh, to many of us here in the room, uh, and the tribal park adjacent to Mesa Verde was uh, a real source of pride for him. And uh, I know our hearts are heavy, but I know he'd want us to carry on uh, and appeal to the best in each other. So uh, it's important to acknowledge his contribution. I know you're going to, you, you have and will carry on in his spirit. Next to the chairman is uh, Jim Dyer, uh, a former board member of the Mesa Verde Foundation. Uh, Jim and I served in the state legislature. Everything I know J. Paul Brown, I learned from Jim Dyer. Uh, he also served in our state senate, served as on the PUC, our Public Utilities Commission, uh, and he is a Marine. Um, and it's really great to see, to see Jim. Uh, always someone who uh, has dedicated himself to causes greater than his own self-interest. Next to, to Jim, we have uh, Bambi Krause, who uh, represents the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers. Welcome. And then finally, we're joined uh, by Dr. Gail Deathloff, Senior Director of the National Parks Conservation Association Center for Park Research. So thank you all for joining us. I'm really eager to hear your testimony. I'm going to turn to the chairman. I'll ask each of you to uh, do all you can to keep your remarks to five minutes so that we can then have a lively conversation and add additional material to the record. So, Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Senator. I appreciate the opportunity here. And thank you for your comments on regarding the South Sea. Definitely a lost case, and I know that if he was here, I would help him instead take my place because he, he was very into uh, preserving the culture and history and tradition. Thank you for your comments, Senator. <clears throat> Good morning, Senator Yudon, distinguished guests. I'm Gary Hayes from the Yuma Ute tribe, which tribes are located in Colorado, northern New Mexico, eastern Utah. Accompanying me today is Mr. Terry Knight, our tribal historic preservation officer for the tribe. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee and bring you information important to the pr protection of all the natural park resources within the Rocky Mountain region. Because of Mr. Knight's knowledge and experience, the U-Mountain Tribe is an active participant in the region as a, as a consulting tribe and partner in many projects. Each, each park within the region has unique assets and common concerns in consulting with, with tribes. The challenge for all in this economy is funding. Careful, goal-oriented budgets regarding staffing and training is key to, to a successful protection of all park cultural resources. The economic forces all agencies to supplement their workforce with voluntary groups and youth conservation groups. How all this affects cultural resources? By hiring and training qualified staff, we can, one, protect the tribal collections and sites, and the laws that protect these previous collection the sites must be firmly enforced. Two, ensure the proper care and maintenance of NICPRA inventories and materials held within the parks. Three, the National Park Service policy for NICPRA and associated objects as follows. Four, implementation of NICPRA policy should include consideration of whether these collections should be held in a regional federal repository and not individual parks. The National Park Service needs to ensure that the 106 tribal consultation protocols are followed and include all of the National Park Service sites, objects, and inventories, as well as the notification of collections they hold in their agencies. In the eyes of the affiliated tribes, <coughs> inadequate information and unproductive consultation costs money and time and creates frustration that the National Park Service, as well as other federal and state agencies, are not adequately considering the tri perspective, tribal perspective and taking advance a device of native cultural heritage. The tribal viewpoint that I have heard expressed is that all federal and state held lands over which Congress and related agencies have jurisdiction because of the culturally rich resources areas are not limited by park boundaries or state borders. 
The tribes request that all training of National Park Service employees includes cultural awareness, competency <coughs> to do their National Park Service duties, and respect for each park's affiliate tribes and pueblos. The Rocky Mountain Region Office of the National Park Service has initiated consultation with its affiliate tribes and pueblos and maintains communication and consideration of their concerns. The cultural heritage and landscapes within the Rocky Mountain Region are important to all affiliated tribes and pueblos. These resources must be protected and appropriately preserved when found on all lands. They are extremely important, far more than their commercial value or artistic pleasure when displayed. They are, they are to the affiliate tribes and pebbles part of the history of Native people, a remembrance of strength of their survival, survival, their initiative, their innovation and life practice. All agencies should consider with respectful attention to the spiritual and cultural <coughs> beliefs concerning sacred sites, sacred activities, and their associated sacred objects. To our people, these are not objects for barter or show. They are tools of, of our lives, the cultural heritage left to us from our ancestors. The you people have protected these lands from the time of immoral. These lands are part of our original homeland, and at one time, a part of our reservation lands. We continue to regard these lands and associate cultural resources with great respect and extremely important to us that these lands be managed and properly regarded to the peoples who have historically occupied these lands, whose ancestors are buried here and who prayed here. We wish to participate in the preservation of these lands and the resources to the greatest extent possible. It is native heritage and practices that give these lands their unique character <coughs> and the preservation and protection of these cultural resources is a fundamental trust responsibility. Again, given the economic landscape, we should <coughs> not forget the important functions of the National Park Service. And Congress needs to support the Park, Park Service's policy of maintaining its long-standing and extreme value relationship with the tribes. In closing, I would like to thank you, Senator Udall and distinguished guests, for the opportunity to express our point of view to establish and advance the tribal government involvement and development and implementation of laws, programs, and policies that affect tribal interests in the protection of our natural resources. Thank you, Chairman Hayes, for that uh, very powerful and eloquent statement, uh, particularly the <coughs> paragraphs. Um, that speak to the uh, value of these lands that are beyond price, uh, that uh, <coughs> so key to uh, the history of the Native people. And uh, well, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Mr. Dyer, it's good to see you, Jim. Uh, thank you. Senator. I should note for the record that uh, Jim Dyer did not submit a statement, which is uh, a, a, his, his uh, uh, way of doing things, which I have always admired. He, he <laughs> speaks from the heart, he speaks from the head. And, uh, and you're using up my time. <laughs> <laughs> you have all the time you'd like. <laughs> we go back a long ways. Uh, I was uh, had a couple of terms in the state house in the Senate or House District 59 that J. Paul Brown ably represents now, and I can't mention J. Paul Brown without mentioning his dad, Casey Brown, and mom Jean, who. Uh, formed uh, this boy. <laughs> Welcome, Jay Paul. Um, yeah, we go back a long ways. And uh, welcome to this part of the world that uh, I was honored to represent in the state legislature. And thanks for mentioning my Marine Corps service, uh, three years in a place called Vietnam. And I'm proud of that service as well. In the mid-1990s, the need for a new visitor and research center became <coughs> evident because the Farview Center was, well, far into the, <laughs> into the park. And many times people were reluctant to drive that distance because they weren't assured of having a, uh, a ticket to go visit the sites. So uh, it became evident that uh, we needed to um, get a place where they could find out about the park much closer to the highway. Uh, there's a uh, apocryphal story that goes around that some uh, tourists from uh, New York, I think it was, asked, how's come the Utes didn't build the site closer to the highway? 
not true. Uh, also, the archaeological collections were stored in the tin shed, which uh, was need, we needed proper storage and conservation preservation. So a new visitor research center would address both these issues. Mesa Verde Foundation was formed in 1997 to, with the goal of building this new center. Uh, the Mesa Verde Foundation purchased land near the park's entrance in 1999. Then the park's boundaries were expanded in 2007 to include this land. And then the Mesa Verde Foundation deeded the <coughs> land over to, to the park. Mesa Verde Foundation raised funds for the architectural design and planning documents for the VRC. These plans, drawings, and also <coughs> were donated to the park for the project. And I can <coughs> note that the 24 tribes who uh, share the heritage of Mesa Verde were involved in the planning of the, of the site. Things like where do you orient the, the entrance to it, and it had to be according to uh, what the tribal folks said it should be. Uh, through the efforts of the Mesa Verde Foundation Board and board friends in particular, Frederick Lau of Phoenix and General Ron Fogelman, U.S. Air Force, he was the 15th Chief of Staff of the Air Force, of Durango in particular, funding was secured through congressional appropriation. Then Representative uh, John Salazar and Interior Secretary Ken Salazar his brother, were instrumental in helping shepherd the appropriation through Congress. About $20 million in stimulus funds from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act went towards the project. Mesa Verde Foundation remains a strong, committed partner to the Mesa Verde National Park. The Foundation's purpose is to fund capital improvements, projects, and educational endeavors that promote an understanding and preservation of the park's cultural and natural resources resources. And that concludes my testimony, sir, and uh, I will sit down and shut up. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Senator Dyer. Uh, a uh, concise and informative uh, set of comments. I, I did want to uh, acknowledge yeah, the, the, the wonderful work that uh, the MBF does and take note that most, if not all, of the National Park units have similar organizations. And increasingly, we're uh, working in partnership with those organizations to complete uh, projects, generate volunteers, and nurture and take care of the park. So thank you for that uh, incredible gift you've given all of us in leading this important effort. Yeah. There were some uh, people early <coughs> on that uh, buying that land was critical to the, the whole, you know, the critical piece of the whole thing. Without that land, it could be a, you know, a 7-Eleven store or something. We'll turn this, no, exactly, I was going to say that. Exactly, exactly, we're all for commerce. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, what, what's important to note is that there are people who love this park who are far, far afield. Uh, mm -hmm. Americans in every state, every territory, and then there are, of course, citizens of other countries who fall in love with Mesa Verde and uh, want to support it, ensure that it's protected in perpetuity, and, and you've created a way in which that can happen. Yes. Ms. Krause, it's great to have you here. The floor is yours. Look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bambi Krause, and I'm the president of the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers. And our chairman, Reno Franklin, had planned on being here today, but unfortunately, family obligations have kept him in California. And he asked that I come here and represent our organization. And as you know, uh, NAFCO submitted a lengthy written statement that uh, will be entered into the record, I'm assuming. And, uh, so I'm just going to summarize some of the points in that testimony. Uh, I think it might. The opening statement, I uh, think NAFBO feels confident that um, cultural preservation is a tribal success story. And with a little time and resources and effort, it could be the premier preservation program in the United States. Uh, you know, we've survived uh, misguided efforts of the federal government to eliminate Native American cultures. They have prohibited the speaking of our native languages and prohibited Native traditional healing practices, and this has created a variety of social and economic and health 
damages throughout our history. Uh, the past, as I said, 150 years have been devastating, and yet Native people are here today. I work with the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, and they were created legislatively 20 years ago in uh, the 1992 amendments to the National Historic Preservation Act. And since passage, the Indian tribes have been more actively involved in the preservation and protection of their culture and life ways. And this last point of uh, helping tribes preserve and protect is the reason why NAFPA was created. Uh, we, um, the 12 original TIPOs in 1998 created NAFPA, were based in Washington, D.C. And today there are 124 Indian tribes participating in the program. Uh, Mr. Terry Knight here in the front row is uh, a living example of the TIPO program in action, and I wanted to recognize him and his family in the back for all their hard work. They're one of the more recent TIPOs, but that is merely a, a name in terms of uh, a TIPO program because uh, Terry Knight has been practicing his culture and traditions for his entire life. Uh, cultural preservation <laughs> is not something that once you become a TIPO, is, you become an automatic expert in traditional Native ways. It is something that is a major commitment for any Native person. <coughs> uh, NAFCO has an annual conference each year, and we also uh, do provide technical assistance to our member tribes, and we also conduct original research and uh, publish reports. And uh, a few that are significant for today's uh, hearing is um, we're about to publish one on tribal cultural landscapes. We published the first ever uh, evaluation of federal agency compliance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. We did an analytical uh, study on uh, tribal consultation and the benefits of actually including tribes at the beginning of all your projects. And then finally, um, we actually had a tribal park and environmental organization summit for the Pacific West region back in 2005, and that was led by, uh, at the time, Pacific West Regional Director John Jarvis. Um, so today I'm just sharing a tribal perspective, and it's one that's rarely heard, and we really appreciate this opportunity, Chairman Yunel, know, and thank you for calling this hearing. Um, I'm probably going to run out of time, but I was hoping to highlight six tribal-specific issues, uh, two tribal park issues, and then one overriding tri tribal agency um, issue. Um, so I'll run through those very quickly. And again, the statement has uh, much more detail. I want to uh, thank Chairman Hayes for bringing up the government-to-government -government relationship and the trust responsibility, because I kind of assume that the whole world knows that now, and uh, NAFCO and our tribal members believe that's one of our bedrocks. So I want to thank Chairman Hayes for making sure that uh, he brought that up. Uh, just to touch on the TIPO program, it's been an overwhelming <coughs> success at the tribal level and the federal agency level. Uh, with a TIPO program, any kind of federal development, uh, any undertaking related to uh, federal monies, has to uh, ensure compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act. So if you have strong TIPO tribal programs, that Indian Health Service Clinic, that tribal school, that road that goes you know, in or out or on a tribal lands, is going to be, uh, it, it's going to be a lot more efficient. And uh, we feel that the TIPO program is not just a feel-good program. It's really essential to um, making Indian country work. It's an important part of the infrastructure that's still needed in Indian country. So I want to make sure that people understand that it's not just a, a feel-good project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the pace of the program is um, very quick. There are 12 in 1996, and now we're up to 124. So the issue is not with the success of the program. The issue is the federal funding. And so, just as an example, there's a disparity between the level of support that states get versus the level of support that tribes get. So the average uh, TIPO grant will be about will be below seventy thousand dollars a year. And uh, I don't have the exact number, but the average SHPO, State Historic Preservation Officer, grants in the hundreds of thousands, usually about five hundred thousand. And uh, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Program has, uh, the tribe has assumed the responsibilities of the state on tribal lands. And so that's the crucial part of that. So I think with my time out, I can keep going or I can come back and bring some other issues up. Why don't we come back to some of the additional <coughs> uh, very, very legitimate and insightful concerns you have. But thank you for that testimony. Uh, Dr. Deathloff, your uh, uh, presence is important. Thank you for being here representing an important uh, stakeholder uh, institution. The floor is yours. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you.
Mr. Chairman, I'm with the Center for Park Research of the National Parks Conservation Association. NPCA is a nonprofit, nonpartisan association dedicated to the protection of our national park system. And the Center for Park Research provides information on resource conditions throughout the system. We appreciate this opportunity to testify because our research shows cultural resources in our national parks are in some jeopardy. In 91% of the parks we surveyed, we found cultural resources were in fair and poor condition. The National Park System encompasses an extraordinary portfolio of American culture, and the National Park Service, through its stewardship of these sites and its national role in preservation activities, is the closest thing the U.S. has to a heritage ministry. As the Senator noted, one finds in the park system nearly 27,000 historic buildings, an estimated 2 million archaeological sites, and 123 million museum and archival pieces. By virtue of the sites, stories, and programs the agency oversees, it largely governs how our cultural, country's cultural resources are managed. Support received from the administration and Congress has a strong bearing on this governance. Over the past decade, our center's staff of preservationists, historians, and anthropologists assessed the condition of heritage properties and collections in 77 parks. To assess the condition of cultural resources, we employed a methodology based on NPS's own cultural resource management guideline, and our findings were recently recently published in the State of America's National Parks. Cultural resources in parks generally did not fare well overall. In parks established primarily to protect such resources, they do fare better, relatively speaking. While we did not assess Mesa Verde, it is our country's flagship archaeological park, and its extensive research program, preservation leadership, and curatorial work indicate a high level of adherence to the cultural resource management guideline and correspondingly healthy resource conditions. Our research shows, however, that Mesa Verde is an exception, not the norm. A history of inattention to cultural resources and inadequate funding have led to decisions that have slighted cultural resources in the system. Across disciplines and designations, parks struggle to identify, document, maintain, and monitor them. Our national parks don't have enough professional staff to take care of cultural resources, and they often lack the funds to pay for the materials to keep them in good condition. To expand on this, if you don't know what you have or what condition it is in, how can you protect it and share it with others? All the parks we assessed lacked cultural planning documents. For example, nearly half of them had no historic structure reports to guide the preservation and maintenance of buildings listed on the National Register. Olympic National Park had virtually all of its archival collections uncatalogued when we assessed it. When information is available on what resources exist at a park and what may threaten them, NPS staff can preserve and interpret them. A good example of this is here at Mesa Verde, where a structural stabilization crew works to maintain cliff dwellings with thorough documentation guiding that crew. Yet cultural resources staffing has declined by more than 25% in the past 10 years. And even in a major cultural park like Appomattox Courthouse, cultural resources management has occasionally been relegated to the level of collateral duties, with staff getting to it when they have the time. Maintenance and monitoring can fall by the wayside <coughs> when staff are absent. For example, at Big Bend, there was no annual monitoring program for historic structures when we assessed them. Knowledge and staff are critical to preserve these places for current and future Americans. It takes money to pay for those staff and for the materials needed to maintain them. NPS cannot currently track the cost of bringing all of its cultural resources into good condition. Only for historic structures do we have a ballpark figure currently estimated at $2 billion. The current rate of funding in the construction budget doesn't allow the parks to keep up, and structural conditions can worsen when maintenance is delayed. With all that said, the challenges to cultural resource stewardship are obviously serious, but they're not insurmountable. In a number of parks, NPS is doing an exemplary job, and for that we commend them. NPCA would make the following recommendations for improving res cultural resource conditions in the national park system. NPS should establish, and Congress should fund, a cultural resources challenge that enables the agency to work effectively on management and preservation to bring America's stories completely to light. NPS should continue programs that address the basic needs of completing baseline documentation for cultural resources, providing staff training, and providing access to technical expertise. NPS should better utilize partners to acquire baseline information, which would alleviate urgent needs and help parks to identify which resource specialists they need over time. Congress can encourage community links to park resources by supporting public transportation enhancements to better connect parks and revising certain regulations to simplify historic preservation tax credits for rehabilitation of park historic structures. NPCA thanks you for the opportunity to address the committee today. 
Given a long history of inattention to cultural resources, we applaud your leadership in convening this hearing. Here at Mesa Verde, it is apparent what can be achieved. This park is a global icon, attracting half a million visitors a year, and a dynamic economic engine for the entire region. NPS staff are on the front lines of caring for our history, but we are all responsible for safeguarding these irreplaceable pieces of it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. <coughs> Deathlaw. Thank you for the uh, all of you on the panel. Let me direct uh, my initial question to you, Doctor. Um, you surveyed uh, many, if not all, of the national park units, and you perform an important function. And uh, we thank you for that. Um, it is, is it your sense that other historic and cultural parks create similar local economic benefits and opportunities as is the case here? I know that we have done economic studies at San Antonio Missions and at Colonial National Historic Park, and in those cases there has been a definite economic value associated with the parks. But San Antonio Missions, um, economic activity was estimated at uh, almost $99 million coming from that park. Um, throughout the surrounding area, supporting over a thousand local jobs. And Colonial National Historical Park was also um, a driver. Then that is the historic triangle that is Williamsburg, um, mm -hmm. Jamestown, and uh, Yorktown. Mm -hmm. So in that area, there was seen to be $42.5 million in visitor spending in 2010. Um, visitation to that park supported that that many millions of dollars in visitor spending. And again, there was an estimate of over a thousand local jobs mm -hmm. coming from that economic activity. I think you could understand why I keep asking that question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's both because I want to draw attention to the economic benefits uh, of the parks, but I also want to look at ways to generate additional local and private sector support as well as government support to protect cultural and historic resources. Is San Antonio Park, is that the Alamo? No, the Alamo it's, is actually a private foundation, I believe, okay. that, that manages it. It does not include the Alamo. Okay. Um, I'm a lawyer, so I can ask questions I don't know that. I'm not a lawyer, so I can, I can ask questions I don't know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, thank you for, for sharing some of those other parks and their statistics. Uh, let me turn Chairman Hayes to you, if I might. Um, as you mentioned, one of the big challenges is finding adequate funding to protect cultural resources. Um, we've got a tough budget situation. Finding additional funding is going to, will, will be difficult in the short term. I'm hopeful, by the way, that uh, we will find a way forward and, and our economy will return to a robust condition, and then we can look to making investments on the, on the government side. Other than finding more money, what do you think uh, is the most important thing we need to do? I know you talked about coordination uh, on the part of the Park Service with the Indian country, but what, what else is on, would be on your list or underline that further if that's the most important thing we should be doing? I think one of the things that we talk about is participation and funding at the levels, as you mentioned earlier. That um, about state funding, the disparities there, mm -hmm. to actually getting the tribes engaged in in that, in that those resources to to help protect and you know it, it, with this economy that we are facing today, you know with the shortfalls and all that, I always tell people welcome to Indian Country, yeah, <laughs> because Indian Country has been facing this for decades, and we've been able to utilize resources, and that's why it's important that I believe that the government utilize. The tribes as an asset to be able to maintain, give you an example, here at Tribal Park. As partnering up and, and establishing a relationship, we can utilize that also and, and it's to build economic development here in, in this area. And, the partner, and partnering up with the tribes is important to be part of that. As you know, you need to generate revenue to off balance the deficit. And that's what I think it's important to tap into the tribal resources and, and, and help as a partner. In, in, and making sure that we protect the, our resources here. One of, one of my takeaways already from the hearing is to work with you to better understand how we can leverage what you just described. And I just want to say one thing to my friend here tonight. That, Please. Um, thank you for your service. And uh, I was in the Navy too. I spent 25 years in the Navy. I retired. So this is there. something watching a sailor in a marine ship. <laughs> <laughs> but but until, until we learn to walk on water, yeah. we need the Navy. <laughs>
<laughs> and I always tell the Marine Corps, I say, look at your emblem here, and what does it say on top? Department of Navy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now settle down. <laughs> no, there's actually an enormously uh, um, synergistic relationship between the Navy and the Marine Corps. And that, that's the type of relationship that's, that's a great. That's a great thing. Yeah, that's you know, a, to be able to work with you. I, like, I, like, I like that metaphor. Yes. Let me turn to, to Jim on that note. Um, on the, on the drive in here, I noticed that uh, both the new visitor center uh, that's under construction and the current far view, which I liked your, your term phrase that it was too far. Um, I know the uh, foundation's been involved in the transition, the old visitor center. Will you tell us more about what's going to happen to the far view visitor center? It's going to become a tribal center uh, with each of the 24 tribes. Uh, having a slice of the pie in there, mm -hmm. and just it, it's a cultural center as opposed to a tourist center. And uh, we're uh, we've shifted since the the twenty million came from the. I don't want to use the word <coughs> stimulus. American uh, recovery and reinvestment. Yes. Approach. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since that, that took care of that, we've shifted our focus in, into rebuilding uh, the far view mm -hmm. into, the, into the tribal cultural center. Well, that, that, that's an exciting development, and uh, I, I look forward to having a chance to visit that uh, center when it's completed. Will that be done in the next couple of years? I imagine it's not an easy to start right now. Well, the, this place doesn't open until next October mm -hmm. when it's down by the highway. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll shift uh, using the, we'll shift targets. And uh, we've already shifted at the foundation into you know, looking for funding for that. Ken, thank you for that, for your leadership and uh, for your love of this, this special place. Let me turn, if I might, to uh, Ms. Krause and, and I'd, I'd uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to share a few more of uh, your thoughts on ways to improve preservation of and education about our cultural resources. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, one way that I don't think it would cost a lot of money is for the Park Service to work with Indian tribes and uh, updating and promulgating regulations on the gathering of traditional plant and mineral materials mm -hmm. on lands that are now managed by the National Park Service. Uh, they, uh, Native people have been the only cultures that have been on U.S. soil for thousands of years. Uh, some may say time immemorial, but it's, you know, scientifically thousands of years. So there's no denying the fact that Native people have been managing the land for thousands of years. And uh, doing so quite well in terms of uh, making sure that uh, in the past, uh, you know, lands that uh, didn't suffer from serious uh, wildfires because the land was managed better over the years. And so uh, right now there is um, some uh, proposals to upgrade the regulations so that uh, <coughs> Native people could uh, gather plant materials for food, medicine, ceremonial objects, uh, the need for a ceremonial canoe which would require a, a large redwood tree, uh, I mean that type of experience. And I think that's a crucial element of Native American cultures today. And it actually in, in inspires some kind of hope with Native people that uh, they don't need to, you know, um, ask for any special permissions, that it was always their right to gather these materials, and it's only been recently that they're told they can't. So try and bridge that gap in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the respect that should be afforded Native people to gather these plant materials without having to go through any enormous challenges. So that's one thing that's on the table. And um, I just want to go back to tribal parks is that I think that's a great economic model. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, for the subcommittee on national <coughs> parks, uh, tribal parks have a great opportunity to preserve additional land from any major development. <coughs> and uh, I know that they've done quite well here in Colorado. But, uh, the Agua Caliente tribe in Palm Springs has significant parks that are a great success story. And, they train tribal rangers, they have tribal employees who are responsible for enforcing the tribes uh, on the coast there. And uh, it'd be great, for example, to see an exchange of tribal rangers with National Park Service rangers to, to share their cultural understandings and, and learn a lot from each other. 
Thank you for those, those examples. I'd like to build on that in a related way and give each of you a chance to uh, uh, talk about what your organizations are doing to encourage young people to uh, be involved uh, with our national parks. This is uh, actually not only something that makes us feel good, but it's a responsibility we, we have. It's a form of paying it forward. It's a form of keeping faith with what's a, in my family a, a part of our credo, Mr. Chairman, which is we, we didn't inherit uh, the earth from our parents. We're, we're actually borrowing it uh, from our children, but we need to share with them what it is that we borrowed from them so they can then keep faith with their children, as we hope to keep faith with ours. I think that as we talk about the partnership, and I remember in the 70s, we used to have tribal members who were part employees here that gave to us here. And that hasn't happened for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And what we do is, on the summer program, we call the Bushwhacker program for our young children. We give them an opportunity to go to the, up to our tribal park and visit and, and just to have an understanding <coughs> and have experience. One of the, the things that we've been talking with the, the district is in our, in our education curriculum, this thing about cultural and language. And to be able to maybe come up with a, a curriculum where it would identify Mesa Verde, historical, look at that, what that, the value it has here, meaning the people who were here before. And I think a lot of times by educating both uh, tribal members and non-tribal members, it would, can, it would, at that generation, at their level, we will build a stronger relationship than we have in the past. And I think that's something that it needs to be taught across the board and in, in probably in the state of Colorado. And that's one of the things that we've been always advocating is to look at the, the not only the youth, but Native Americans in the, in the school curriculum and what they offer. And I think this is another avenue, as it was mentioned about the, the center down here, of uh, educating the general population and the world. You know, we get many, many uh, foreigners coming to our tribal park. Mm -hmm. And we don't advertise, we just we, we maintain it in a, in, a, in a respectful way. And as mentioned by Ms. Kyle, that you know, we do know how to take care of our resources. And by helping us being at the table and, and identifying and working with Terry and many of our tribal leaders in, in preservation of our culture, I think that would be a win-win situation across the board for our services. Well, I would welcome some, any additional ideas as well. I know Historic Officer Knight uh, mm -hmm. probably has a lot of ideas that, we, that, I, that we would love yes. to see included in the record and yes. that we could, we could uh, consider. Jim, uh, I know you've been really focused on uh, the capital needs of the park. Do you, do you do any work in this area of uh, working with the park to encourage young people to uh, enjoy and learn from these resources? have not. Uh, I will put that on my to-do list. <laughs> well, we know we know the visitor center has to get done and, yeah. the, and the conversion. Yeah. First things first. First then. things first. Yeah. Um, Doctor De Deathlock, do you uh, have any Operate. insights into what you do or you think we could do? Well, MPCA has supported in the past uh, the East Service Floor legislation mm -hmm. then in, in Congress, um, which is not passed at this point in time. But the other thing that we do directly along with supporting um, that sort of legislation is uh, we have corporate partners that we work with on volunteer opportunities where we've had school children, school age children in the parks working on things like um, marking fences for pronghorn migration paths. Um, we have our California Desert Park field office has done a lot of work um, with bringing out volunteers, including children working with the Marine Corps, actually, <laughs> on a, uh, from Camp Pendleton on a native plant reseeding and um, restoring those. And we also, uh, as an organization, have family days where we, uh, particularly our Central Valley office, is one where we've reached out to non-traditional park visitors and tried to bring more of the Latino, um, Latino families, not necessarily to Yosemite National Park, but down in the Fresno area, and we've educated them a bit more about the park, try to connect them more with those places. And our other regional offices also do family days that have a similar, similar event to them. 
I wanted to note uh, too, since the deputy regional director is here, that I've been impressed with uh, this last year the activities at Colorado National Monument that Michelle Wheatley in particular had put in place. And then I had an opportunity to be in the Great Sand Dunes National Park, and there's a wonderful set of outreach to those local communities, to high school and younger youth, to experience uh, that park. So those are, uh, those are two local models of, uh, of success. I wanted to uh, ask you if you've had any response to uh, Ms. Krause's comment about tribal and park ranger uh, cross-training uh, opportunities or potential. There may be some of that happening right <coughs> now. Uh, if you had either a reaction now or a reaction to the, to the record later. Um, just a personal reaction. I think it sounds like a, a great idea. That's um, win-win, and we would all benefit from doing that. We can build on the sailors and marines. Gary and Jim created for us. Um, Ms. Cross, let me move move back to you, if I if I might. Um, I had a question I prepared. I think you spoke to this, but um, you said over 120 tribes now have their own historic preservation programs. Most of those set up in just the last decade. Um, when a tribe develops that interest, uh, what's the cost to make that idea real? And how much of the uh, funding comes from the Federal Historic Preservation Program, SPICIT versus other? Uh, so, you're just gonna, so I understand, how much is the cost of the government or the tribe to establish a tribal historic I think starting with the tribe, but then, and then how much uh, are we able to help? And, well, the answer is, in a succinct way as possible, mm -hmm. uh, the tribal level uh, requires that the government uh, institute its own process on how the officer will interact with the tribal government. And so they become the point person for federal agencies. So that's mm -hmm. the level of responsibility that the TIPO has at the tribal level. Mm -hmm. So that requires a tribal component to all get on board and support it. So uh, however much it costs the tribe to get through the tribal council process, probably. So that, that could, that's a separate issue. But the federal government uh, supports the tribal historic preservation officers and the state historic preservation officers from the historic preservation fund that uh, has recently come under some attack, unfortunately, but you know, it's one of the really crucial pieces of the funding puzzle for historic preservation in our country. So, um. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I'm getting an update. We, we, uh, <laughs> we're, uh, uh, I hear, super, we've got a plow maybe that's going to uh, run through it. 12.35, 12.40, 12.45, so we're going to begin to wind down the, the hearing over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Oh. But that's what that was the idea. I was getting because Terry gave a very powerful prayer. And, uh, let me, um, uh, and that you're, you know, I didn't hear all of what you had to say, but the, your comments are over the record. Um, but I thought, um, as we, because this, this has been very helpful to me, uh, that before I end the hearing, I'd like to uh, turn to each and every one of you and uh, give you a chance to make some final comments. Um, and in that uh, comment, if you would, if, if, if it fits your view, uh, I'd love to ask you what you're, you think the number one priority for ensuring the protection of our cultural treasures for our children uh, should be. And uh, I'll start with the chairman. I think Laura had a chance to share her thoughts with us on that, but let me start with the, the future of this. I think one of the, um, on a tribal perspective, is to be able to engage the tribe in that consultation process and having us at the table, as you always heard this term, a lot of people use on the menu, and we want, we've always been on the menu, and I think with everything that's happening with the tip and with, um, we talk about the tribal side, you know, we, are, we feel that's very important, that's why Terry wears many hats. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about limited resources, that's what we have to utilize. And we have tribal members and, and such as uh, Terry stepping up to the plate with limited resources on the tribal side to, to step up and help us in, in, in uh, preservation of our culture and, her and, uh, and heritage. But that would be the really the number one. Any programs or any policies that, that are uh, being considered, 
need to have this tribal perspective, especially when it's within any country, when an area are. I think by that we can be able to uh, be a part of participating in the plans and implementation of laws or statutes that will be created. Thank, thank you. I think that's a very timely, very important, and uh, as, as I think I can say, it's been overlooked uh, in the past. We should go the extra mile and ensure that it doesn't happen. Uh, Chairman Dyer, we've got a lot of titles for you. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yeah. um, Mesa Verde Foundation is oriented towards building things, brick and mortar, and, and just that's just the way we found it, and, and that's been the orientation. There is another organization, the Mesa Verde Museum Association, and they are more well, they, they run the bookstore, for mm -hmm. one thing, so sure. they've got a funding source. Right. But uh, they're the educational arm of what uh, the volunteer effort goes to. And uh, we do uh, coordinate with one another. I'm the designated Mesa Verde guy to sit as the museum association does, does its magic. So uh, we're in sync. But uh, I think after being here today, I think the Mesa Verde Foundation needs to take another look at uh, the educational component of what uh, we can do. Thank you for that insight. Uh, Ms. Krause. Well, I want to um, state that in terms of the working relationship with Indian tribes and the Park Service, I don't think it's ever been at a more positive point. Mm -hmm. And under Director John Jarvis, who you know, he's had a long history of working with tribal governments, but I know that NAFCA is encouraged and looks forward to continuing to work with the Park Service. And um, in the, the written statement, it actually states that perhaps the next generation of Native people will be allowed to express their history from their own point of view and be a present part of the story for park visitors who want to hear the authentic story of tribal connections to natural and cultural resources. I think that summarized uh, our point of view very well. Mm -hmm. Um, de Tocqueville, the great French observer of America uh, in the 1830s, uh, among many insights that still hold today, Jim, I know you and I have talked about this, in fact, it's America's strength is her capacity to undo her mistakes. And, and uh, sometimes you wonder, uh, Churchill also said that you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> we, we, uh, we have more work to do to uh, build, uh, and I say we, the majority uh, uh, culture in America, to rebuild the trust and the relationship and the friendship with, with Indian country. And I'm deeply committed, because it has been my family, to do so. Uh, having said that, it's easy to say that. It's, it's challenging. To do to do that, but the comment you just made gets right to the right to the heart of that. And I know there are other countries in other parts of the world that also struggle uh, with uh, that challenge and that responsibility. Uh, but uh, we need to continue to struggle, and, and I appreciate the way in which you outlined what I see as a real opportunity. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Deflin. Well, I would say from the report we did with the 77 parks. Um, the, the issues are very interrelated, but if you look at it in somewhat of a linear fashion, we would say that the MPS needs to have the means to document what they have. And that's, it's not very sexy, but it's what you build on. Mm -hmm. What you build up all the way through this program to interpretation. And interpretation, when you, have, you have strong foundation for interpretation, you have strong interpretation, that's what gets people to connect, that's what gets people to care, that's what gets people to learn from these places. And um, so we would, we would stress that as, as an important component of, of improving cultural resources, is, is doing that, that fundamental work. And then you'll have people wanting to preserve these incredibly important components of our, of our culture and our history. Powerfully stated and completely on point. Uh, th thank you for that. 
uh, set of insights and your testimony really covered all the ways in which we could, we could do that. So I, again, thank you. Um, I, I want to um, bring the hearing to a close. I'm going to make a couple of additional comments and um, then again, it gives a chance, I think, to visit a little bit before the, the plow literally, I think, is going to lead a convoy down. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it could be a wonderful afternoon. To, uh, when it clears, right, historic officer night, we're going to see a clearing at some point. And, uh, <laughs> and God's creation will be in front of us in all its glory and, and long vistas. Um, I, I, I'm some, someone who believes strongly that you not only need uh, an economically diverse society and that your natural systems need to be diverse <coughs> but cultural diversity uh, although in some quarters uh, debated uh, is crucial for the for our species uh, there's no one way of being human uh, there are cultures uh, all over our world uh, that were strong uh, that were fascinating that uh, lived in harmony with uh, Mother Nature, and I think at great risk do we let cultures become extinct, uh, as well as ecosystems or economic economies. And in, in a sense, we got we got that question in a broader way here today, in a way that was moving for me. Particularly, Chairman Hayes, your your comments um, uh, really hit home. Um, I think we also uh, acknowledge the important role that our parks play in our our economy. And given the tough times that we face, uh, we should take note. I uh, am a longtime uh, mountain guide. Um, my friends like Jimbo Buker would wonder what got into me to become a politician. But there are, there's been very good news out of the outdoor recreation industry these last two years. That their sales are up, whether they be for equipment or guided trips or whatever it may be. And people in our country are staying at home a little bit more and taking advantage of these <coughs> marvelous natural resources we have, and we continue to see many people from other countries travel to America. So I think it's important to underline the key role in our economic um, health that our parks play. And then finally, uh, our national parks do continue to be one of our best ideas, or our America's best idea. And uh, the, uh, again, to speak to Ms. Krauss and others, that if our parks can bring us closer together as Americans in all our various shapes, backgrounds, religions, uh, cultural outlooks, uh, all the better for the national parks. And truly, uh, uh, the moniker, America's Best Idea, would, would hold fast and we could expand on Jim, you want to comment? Uh, just uh, your last name is Udall. Uh, I think politics is in the DNA. <laughs> it's, a, it's a defective gene. <laughs> That's why I'm a big supporter of genetic research. <laughs> but again, let me thank um, uh, Cliff, your, your great uh, staff, the, the work <coughs> that you do, uh, the flat hats are special, uh, and uh, the people who took the time, the citizens who are here, uh, it's, really, it's really great to share this important hearing with you. Uh, we'll keep the record open for additional questions and statements. Uh, I hope everybody gets home safely.